Welcome to the Soul Path Sessions podcast with Deborah Mines Pearson and Brenda Littleton. Brenda is an educator and counselor rooted in Jungian and eco psychology. She helps her clients understand the importance of the mind, body, spirit, and earth relationship for healing. Deborah is a licensed psychotherapist and has been trained in traditional and sacred psychology, exploring from the ground up what makes our human experience meaningful, wholesome, and enlightening. Deborah and Brenda invite you to accompany them on a soul path journey as they explore the possibilities of living a more soulful life as therapists, seekers, and lovers of fate. So welcome back, everybody. Um, Today, lovely Brenda and lovely Deborah are going to explore initiations, invitations, and epiphanies. And what's so interesting to me is that we are here on Easter, Ramadan, full moon, full moon, Passover, Earth Day, Earth Day. Jeez, it's a lot of stuff to celebrate. And all the roses are blooming, and the plants and the are singing like a Disney film. It's all so happy. So we thought we'd share some stories and see where it goes from there. And initiation, um, <clears throat> even from just looking at the your beautiful rose bush outside coming in oh, announcing yeah. that the spring is here. Yeah. yeah. I had I, I was away for a couple of weeks and came back and there had been a dove nest with eggs and when I got back they were all gone. So I know that this transmission of birth and into spring is in full bloom. I flew the coop. Yeah, yeah. I felt, <laughs> I felt really, really good. Little shells. So initiation um, we talked last time about going into our own soul journeys, our own history of when we knew, when we uh, pathed, when we crossed our path into initiation where we knew that we could not not know anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, starting from young, young little girls to going into adolescence to then becoming women. So... Yeah. Um, I know we have varied paths and lots of experience, and that the whole goal here is to not only reaffirm our initiations, but also share with those who may be also wanting to remember their initiations. That's so true, because I think it gets kind of filed back in in the place, like, oh, that's weird stuff that happened to me. Yeah. And yet, why do we file it away? Um, well, part of my work is <clears throat> remembering. I I've, yeah. think I shared with you this this turning point, this pivot I had where I'm so tired of working in the world of healing and uh, journeying out and becoming as opposed to remembering and, and being whole. Mm-hmm. And so when you brought up the idea of initiation, mm-hmm. I thought, oh, this is the beginning step. This is really inclusive of understanding who we are and remembering who we are. Right, this in the, on our soul path, right? Yeah. So, um, I guess I'll go first and tell my story. Okay. Okay. You tell. <laughs> All right. So, one of my first things that happened to me was extremely weird. Um, my dad was an executive that he moved us all over the country, and I ended up in Houston, Texas, as a senior in high school. I was not happy about it, and I cried the entire summer. I mean, it was a bummer, right? Bummer summer, and. I gave up the lead in the senior play. I mean, I got finally got into my groove. You know, my junior year, I found my path. I mean, I was, I loved to dance. I loved drama. I was involved. I was so involved in all that stuff. I had to leave my dog and cat. Everybody had to be left behind. Boyfriend. So I cried buckets. And I basically said to my parents, my dad goes like, please stop crying. Because seriously, it was filling up the rooms, coming out the windows. I would not stop. And um, so I said, you know, I don't know. I think I might go back and go back to California. And I had a friend. Honestly, she wasn't even that good a friend, but she offered to let me go back to California and get all my stuff back, all, the th- all my friends, you know, graduate with my class at Glendale High. And I was really tempted, and I told my mom this. And she, uh, my mom was devastated because really it was hard, to, you know, to, 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 to lose your daughter to that. And she didn't really know these people, but I was pretty headstrong. And so I went off to school telling her this is my last day. 
I so was, you left? No. I went to the school, um, Westchester High in Houston, Texas, and I was seriously out of place. I'd been in a drama track, and they didn't have one. They had a science track. I mean, it's Houston. And I was uh, like in beginner math. I mean, I was like in geometry, and I'm a senior because I didn't do math. I just wasn't doing math. So I'm just sitting there minding my own business, and the announcements come over. You know, you listen to the announcements in the morning. I was in first period geometry class with a bunch of ninth graders. <laughs> Big doofus. And all of a sudden, I heard this guy you know, one of the students said, uh, don't be, it was like a little homily, like, don't be so busy looking at yesterday's rain that you ignore today's sunshine. That's all he said. I mean, so what? But what happened inside of me, I can only describe as, if you've seen the movie Powder, you will know what I experienced. I suddenly couldn't see. My whole body exploded into white light. There was no Deborah. I could, I was, I, I just exploded into white light. There was no, nothing there. And um, I didn't really have time to assess the situation. I just wasn't a 17-year-old sitting in geometry class. I, I had disappeared and exploded. Tell me more. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> the story's over. Uh, so I came back into my body, and I was like, oh, I'm going to stay in Houston, and I'm going to... I, I'm going to sign up for the school play. I signed up for clubs. I got the lead in the senior play in Houston. Um, and Houston, we have contact. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, kind of. And one day I was like, I'm going to be part of the Glee Club and I'm going to join. I didn't even like these things. I mean, I joined things I didn't even know about. I just joined everything. I tried out for the senior play. And I came, I, I went out to the car. My mom picked me up and she was already, you know, and I told her what happened. I go, we got to go by the yard stores. I got to get special buttons for this shirt I'm wearing. She's like, you're staying? And I go, yeah, I'm, I'm staying. And she said, oh, she goes, I was on my hands and knees. And I was praying for you. I said, my mom was a really strong Christian. And she said, I just gave you to the Lord. And I said, Lord, Debbie, as I was known those days, Debbie's going to leave if that's your will. But I just prayed, I prayed with everything. And I prayed for like, I go, were you praying like around 7.15 or 8 o'clock this morning? <laughs> she goes, oh yeah. <laughs> I go, oh, that's, well, let me tell you what happened to me. So that was my first thing that ever happened. It changed me. I was, I was reset. So did you feel akin to what your mother's references were oh yeah i was like let's go incidental <laughs> but did yeah. you feel christian like i mean were you no. in you know, well was, i shouldn't say no. no 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 that wouldn't be fair i think i felt see there's there's a thing like you can be a christian and call yourself that or you can have an experience like christ had mm -hmm. so for me my mom was really invested in trying to really understand what jesus was saying you know, and, and my family were big on prayer. So, but I ignored a lot of that, you know, as a kid. But when this happened, I was like, wow. Hmm. Yeah. It makes me wonder <clears throat> if your mother was projecting or, or feeling like you were acting out her feelings about being yanked. Her, I mean, she was yanked out of her life too mm -hmm. and dumped in Houston and, and having to, be a, a role model for you as far as this is what we do in this family we we move and we we make our life whole and we move forward and here you were acting out the sense of melancholy and and you know just total loss and I'm wondering if you represented that part of her as well that was having those hiccups along oh yeah the we way. were really close so yeah. she told me but she just wasn't 17 right yeah. you know so, so um, yeah, she'd that, been through her own stuff. That know. sense of watermarking then of being that white light and then making the pivot and saying, I'm here and this is what my life is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you, so is, is what I'm intrigued of is that it, it, it became you. So did you rely on that point? Were you able to go back there to that place often and recall upon 
the, that sense of empowerment and becoming white light and realizing that whatever it is that you're facing, you're able to go through it? Or was it there a sense of renewal that you... I think I was just young enough to go, like, that's a thing that happens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and nobody understood it. I still, to this day, don't know what happened. And it's okay. happened to me two times. Um, and, and so the second time it happened um, was when I was really sick and I couldn't get well. And I'm And uh, this was years later, and my doctor just said something to me, my physician, my my general practitioner, and the same thing happened. And the light went on, and I was completely healed. And what he said to me, because I couldn't get, I had the blood profile of an AIDS patient. I was like, he said, do you not want to live? And I'm like, well, I think I do. I was raising a couple kids. Of course I want to live, but I just couldn't get well. But he said, well, you don't, your blood doesn't look like this. And so he said, he, he took me by the hand shows how powerful healers can be, teachers, doctors. He said, you know, when you're young and you play the violin, they give you a really clunky violin so you can drop it and you don't need to tune it. But if you play the violin for a long time and you get really good, they might give you a Stradivarius and they have to tune it every time it plays or it plays worse than a beginner violin. And then he, he held my hand and he said, you, my dear, are a Stradivarius. And I kind of went into this trance state. And I went out to my car. I sat down. And the white light went on. And my whole body disappeared. And I went back the next week. And I had no sign of illness. Mm. I, got a re- I got rebooted. Yeah. If you can explain this, let me know. It's powerful. But it let me know there's something bigger. Yeah. And the molecules were responding, yeah, in a way. And the molecules are, are responding, and I had an epiphany. So that's that's a spiritual word, and I'm looking at like uh, John O'Donohue, and he talks about the Greeks believed that time had secret structure. There was a moment of epiphany when time suddenly opened and something was revealed in luminous clarity. Mm. There was a moment of crisis when time got entangled and directions became confused and contradictory. There was also the moment of Kairos. This was a propitious moment. Time opened up in kindness and promise. All the energies cohered to offer a fecund occasion of initiative, creativity, and promise. Part of the art of living wisely is to learn to recognize and attend to such profound openings in one's life. Mm Miraculous. If I said that like John O'Donohue, it would have been better because he has an <laughs> Irish accent. But he's also dead. So. Well, he's yeah. right here. <clears throat> yeah. Beautiful. Spontaneous. Epiphany is the best word I can come up. Yeah. It was light. So that that's my story, Brenda. I'm sticking to it. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I like the way that it returns. That was kind of the original question I had is like, can you, does it, how does it live in your life now? Can it be recalled? I have, and the reason I ask that is because I have, in my own initiation, there's, a, there's these moments that return. And um, and a couple of podcasts ago, we spoke of the imaginal cells and mm-hmm. how it seems to have its own design for us, and one can't predict, but it does. It does return, and so. In, with the imaginal cells recurring with your, um, how, did, how did you phrase it? This moment of light, you left your body, the moments of... I didn't have a body. Yeah. I became light. Yeah. I can't explain, uh, like that movie Powder, the guy just... Mm. So I've always had this sense, and my spiritual name means lover of light. Mm. Jyoti Priya is the white light from heaven or, that comes down, the, the column of light. And that is my way of seeing God, is light. Not solely, but that's really a powerful connector. And um, I, light is mentioned a lot in the Bible and in all the holy books. I mean. And the fact of the white light and the healing pro- properties where your blood was uh, turned to light. It was. Yeah. It, de- it definitely was. And we use, you know, the doctors use light nowadays. They use different colors of light to heal cancers. Mm-hmm. So I had my own 
healing. Mm. And there was no way to turn back. You know, how do you explain? I turned into a puffball and I exploded. Now I want to stay in high school. <laughs> or I was sick yesterday, but today I'm fine. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a uh, personal testimony to the belief that miracles do happen in the sense of the personal, the the initiation of the personal, that this is a sacred personal initiation into your own truth. Like you will never not believe it. No, I I don't really, I'm not really into believing things. When things have happened to me and I've gone backwards, like, okay, that's weird. Well, Paul on the road to Damascus, he got stricken. (laughs) I knew about that, but it happened to me. And because it happened to you, you can sit with clients as well who Mm -hmm. will come in and you'll have that capacity for them to explore what they may not be able to articulate. Yeah. That was my like first really conscious weird thing that happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm very comfortable with the weird because it's weird. (laughs) (laughs) even talking you know listening talking it's weird have you shared this often Uh, when necessary usually don't just say things out of the blue yeah when it's necessary I don't yeah if somebody needs me to tell them that I get what they're talking about uh light has come and also when I know some I'm gonna how do I put it I see auras so sometimes I mean don't you Mm -hmm. okay Uh, so you can tell your own but like uh when I met my husband, who was my second husband, Jaja, but I, he told me we were going to get married. I'm like, I don't want to do this marriage thing. <laughs> a little hippie girl. And I looked at my hand, and I put my hand on my, I had my hand on my womb, and my womb was bright yellow. It was golden light was coming out of my womb. I'm like, that's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out I had beautiful children with that man. Mm-hmm. That was, was supposed to happen. And... My husband now, first time I saw him, that's another story I won't go into, but he was opening a door and he was, his aura was just in golden light and I didn't think a thing of it. So you in light, light is a, is a factor. I mean, for the idea of turning into light, seeing light, having the aura be more of an enunciation, like at the, the typical, the, the classical art is when you have that aura, when you have the light, it's the enunciation mm-hmm. of, of healing and um, spirit. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm all over it. I cool. love it. Cool. Yeah. Well, so, thank you. So, so Brenda, wow. this is Sharon Tell. So <laughs> you get to tell. Well, a story. I'm still sitting with the mm-hmm. you poof, you know, poofing being light and and really trying to like I was tracking that and feeling in my own body what that must have felt like. So I was really enjoying the the sensation. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. My initiation is not so much. <sighs> The although it it is a somatic space, it's not a much um, located in the body. It's it's really it's having points outside of the body from starting as a very young girl, like four years old, and um, being lost in the forest and um, and 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 having this experience of me asking like, is this it? Uh, Having the wherewithal to be lost and to be four years old and to sit down on a log and say is this it is this the end of my life Mm -hmm. and to receive clear instructions that no you have a choice no you you don't have to you you don't have to go you can stay here and remembering in my body coming the the empowerment of the body really locating itself and saying, okay, then if I'm going to be here, then I'm going to find my way out and everything will be fine. Was it like a voice? Was it a voice you heard from outside of you? Yeah. Did it feel like it was inside of you? No, or it was inside, but it, I wasn't, disso- I don't think I was dissociated. Uh, could be. I mean, if I was to do a, you know, a, an analysis of a personality, I would mm-hmm. be very tempted to say I was a point of dissociation, but um, but I recognized it later on, and I've had multiple experiences where my life was on the line, and um, and, and and really death faced. I faced death um, in moments. Uh, like one experience, I was 18, driving up in my car from LA to Big Sur, and and I had been living in Canada, and I was driving this French car, it's Peugeot. 
And for whatever reason, I was um, leaving my parents' house in L.A., going up to Marin to pick up two girlfriends, and off we were to continue to Vancouver Island. And I decided that I was going to enjoy the coast one more time. And, and so I was traveling up <clears throat> PCH, and right before Esalen, what, and I wasn't going fast, and it wasn't raining, and it wasn't a landslide, but for whatever reason, three of my tires burst, oh, and wow. I spun out. And as I was spinning, and I was spinning, and there was no one on the road, uh, the front left tire went over the guardrail, and I pivoted, and so the other tire, the rear tire, was over the cliff as well. And so I had two tires off the cliff, and I could feel the car kind of teetering. And I very gingerly climbed over to the passenger side, got out, and I saw that I was hung up, that there was no way the car was going to go over the cliff. But I realized I have to get myself out of here. I have a date in Marin. Um, there's, this was before cell phone. And I thought, OK, I'll just walk down to Esalen. So I, I truck gone down, and I knock on the door the wooden gate and here comes this guy with his little baby goat <laughs> and it, it sounds turns, like pan yeah it, would, it felt was a very pan moment and I realized afterwards many 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 years later that the person who had answered the gate and was helping me was, was, was Richard Tarnas I didn't know that at the time could care less who Richard Tarnas was well, tell, tell the audience who they are well he is I'm well sorry. later uh, 30 years later I was in Pacifica mm-hmm. Uh, doing a PhD in depth psychology, and my guest lecture for the semester was Richard Tarnas, and um, and I I realized at that moment that he was the guy that helped me <laughs> get off the cliff, yeah. and and as I was, but that's not the end of the story. Um, he helped me get the auto club, and we got the car on the road. We got the tires switched, and it's like late in the evening, and the sunset's happening. I have to get through San Francisco to get across the bay to go to Marin and mm-hmm. find these ladies. Well, I hadn't really eaten. And I was, I, I'm sure I was dehydrated. Kind of came down off some endorphins, and and that highway one goes through the city to get to the Golden Gate. And so you're dealing with a lot of hills mm-hmm. and steep hills and lots of lights and it was dark. And I was looking, I was focusing on the wrong light. And so when I saw a green light, I would go through it, but really my own stop sign, my own stop light was red. So I would, I went, I just I charged through an intersection in downtown San Francisco at 10 o'clock at night. Is this on the same day? Same day. Oh, Lord. And I get spun around, and I'm spinning and spinning and spinning, oh. and I don't get hit. I, I, it's just kind of like a uh, clock work, and I end up, and I'm facing the right way. And so instead of stopping and getting out and apologizing all over the place, I, I gun it. I go up to the next light. Same thing happens again. I see green light. But it's I'm at a red light stop, and I mm-hmm. and I go through traffic again, and this time I spin around and it's, and and I'm saying to myself, is this it? Is this it? Am am, am I dead? Is is this? And I hear the voice that says, No, you have a choice. You can stay. You know. And so as soon as I hear that, No, you have a choice. Mm-hmm. I choose life, and I know that I've chosen life, and so I'm not going to die. So if I'm not going to die, get the hell out of here and get yourself through it and and accomplish the goal. Mm-hmm. It happened one more time. So it's three times of the red light. On the light, same trip? Same trip. Same. And it's like, no, you have a choice. So going off the cliff, uh, meeting, meeting like Richard. Roger Rabbit. Roger yeah. Rabbit is driving this car. And I get to Marin and off we go the next day. Um, there's other episodes along the way in my life, several. But the most recent one happened four, five years ago where I unexpectedly go out late at night I was hosting a guest horse I had three horses at the time they were my family of 24 years we had this innate communication and this guest horse could hardly make a decision for herself she did not know how to walk out of a stall by on her own accord she had to be led out and so she had been with me for a couple of days and I went out late at night just to check on everyone and I opened the gate to let this guest horse out and she bolted unexpectedly and pushed the gate open. I fell back and I scared her because I normally don't fall down mm-hmm. and um, especially in front of her 
and she she pivoted she freaked out and as she was turning around and I was on the ground she stuck her hind hoof right on my chest Mm -hmm. and um, pivoted and pivoted and pivoted and so her hoofs were all over me and again I left my body and because it was just so much pain and I said is this it because I I knew my body was broken Mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to be on some life support and Mm -hmm and linger and I said if this is the time for me to go please tell me because Mm -hmm. I will do so willingly and again the voice said no you have a choice Mm -hmm. so in you know it just Mm -hmm. back into my body out of your body were you looking down at it Mm -hmm. and I because I was in so much pain I ended up by breaking my back in three places and breaking three ribs that was fairly recently I was about four years ago yeah and I knew that I wasn't going to die, so I had to get up off the ground, and mm-hmm. I had to get back to the house and get some help. And um, and each one of these episodes in reflection, um, the last one didn't take very much reflection, and I talked about it before, um, where I was not acknowledging my choices in life, and so the body, the somatic work, the psyche, you know, what, what you choose not to live, uh, to acknowledge becomes fate, was becoming fate. And uh, so my initiation involves uh, deep, deep fear, <laughs> life-threatening yeah. Yeah. Sick situations, where I don't know how I learned it, but I remember being a very little girl saying, is this it? And being told, no, you, you have a choice. What a big question for a four-year-old. I mean, I'm just going back to that one. Yeah. Do you have any idea why that question was there for you? Well, it was a very arduous trip. I was in the backseat of a car going from Port Alberni to to Tofino, which was at that time on a logging road uh, full of logging trucks. It was pouring down rain, uh, horrendous torrential rain low visibility windows were up to keep the heat in and my both my parents were in the front seat smoking Mm -hmm. like chimneys and I was in the back seat having ears nose and throat contamination and cranky Mm -hmm. and um, screaming and my mother just couldn't handle it It she's like that's it you know I've been had been screaming for three hours and they stopped the car and my mother put me outside oh see there's a backstory yeah important and I just said um fine you're going to put me out here. I'm going to walk away. And I walked uh-huh. into the forest. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I met this this voice, this self. Yeah. You were ready to go. Like, I was. You guys are going to treat me like this. I'm out of here. Yeah. I was sick. Uh-huh. I was really ill. And so trauma I, can drive you out of your body. Trauma drives me out of my body. And mm-hmm. also nature provides sanctuary. Yes. I was a very young girl realizing I'm not getting in this car. I'm not driving on this friggin' logging road. I'm going into the bush yeah, and take sanctuary. So I've always had great how relief. They, how did they get you out? Well, it was the beginning of my punishment. Like I was beginning to punish people. Like mm-hmm. I, I thought, fine, you're going to put me out. You're going to smoke up the car. I'm going to go and sit in this bog mm-hmm. with skunk cabbage and look at the fairies. Oh, yeah. And um, that's where I found. And, and ever since then, it's always been nature. You know, it's, it's been, if I have a, anything to work out, anything in my body, my heart, my soul, my mind, it's go into nature. And I have great relief. It's, it's your, it's similar to your moment of deconstruction where you become light. Yeah. I actually entrain myself with the heartbeat of the earth, or the tree, or the yeah. whatever is there. I get you. And I, it, it's yeah. just, it just envelops and soothes me. Me too. But I, I hear that like that moment of trauma. Um, yeah, that's Mother Nature. There's a name for Mother Nature. You know, mm. she embraces us, and she kept you here. So it does give me pause um, when I, <clears throat> with if I know I'm not paying attention to choices that are compensation uh, made out of compensations or out of um, defense p- mechanisms. I realize I can only do that for so long. It will allow me to maintain an existence up to a point, but then I have to really let go and reassess and and readjust and and to claim what I've tried to avoid. And 
I and I've been conscious of that the last five years mm-hmm. and it does keep me whole it does allow me to work toward being whole yeah. and uh so that that's the benefit well th- th- so my follow-up question is when you were on Mr. Toad's wild ride you know getting and you went down by Essel and all that yeah. and the spin outs and the pivots a lot of yeah. pivots what was what was going on I really um I, I love that part of the world. Mm-hmm. I spent uh, quite a bit of time at Julia Pfeiffer State Park and along the creek, and um, I felt so pure and creative and loved just by that space without anybody. Mm-hmm. And I had a, um, you know, I was a bit conflicted mm-hmm. in going up uh, to Vancouver, back to Vancouver Island. Well, I, it sounds like it. Yeah. Seriously, I mean, yeah. you you spun out. I mean, you, three times or Four. so? Four? Yeah. Okay, so you met Pan, <laughs> nature god, <laughs> and then you kept spinning. Do you think you're trying to turn around? Go back? Um, to me, it was more of a vortex. Okay, like, I, I right. tend to work with vortexes. Uh, that yeah, they seems, work with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So whenever there is a, an emotional yeah. uh, war going on yeah. in my life, it's a vortex. Uh-huh. And so I, that's the energy the I chaos. work with. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I wrote a thesis on chaos and about the predictable unpredictability, or the, uh, the, yeah, the predictable unpredictability. Mm-hmm. Um, and that from that work, I launched a whole new life, which mm-hmm. carried me up until now. And so... I've learned to be open to those those vortexes mm-hmm. and those patterns, and I'm not afraid of them. And, wow! And it, it, I, I enjoy them actually. Uh, <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow, that's exciting. I mean, how do you enjoy them? I like the energy. I like being in the center of them. Uh, I like observing them, and I like understanding. Uh, the transitoriness of it and what what's being like uh, often I live in a place where I get 40 mile and not 40 mile not winds often and I look out and I say that soil on the ground over there um, is here today and then I look out tomorrow and it's soil from torrents mm-hmm. you know it's it's just it's just transitory mm-hmm. and um, and it's allowed me to feel okay without being contained mm-hmm. and most of my path since 20s uh, has been uh, being secure, feeling secure with insecurity, mm-hmm. uh, being comfortable with the uncomfortable, mm-hmm. and, and, and not so much inviting it and having to have that chaotic yeah. life, but yeah. knowing that that 401k isn't going isn't gonna to be security for me. There's, mm-hmm. there, there's more. And You're in flow. Mm-hmm. Flow state. Yeah. A bit more. Yeah. I think you trust the process. I do trust the process, even mm-hmm. though I may not dance with it as gracefully as others, but I do trust it. And mm-hmm. I am also very curious now as I'm in my last third of my life, mm-hmm. I'm wondering how many more times I'm going to be asking that question. I know. Yeah. Like how many more things, yeah. like initiations. And is it um, only from, I mean, how many more initiations do people have? I go. I go through periods of like intense initiation where I really feel like I can't stop it. It's just going to keep happening. Um, And I know I'm in like the sacred spot, kind of like you are talking about. And I, I mean, people probably don't want to stand next to me when it's going on. Um, I mean, I know something's going to come down now at this age. I know something's going to happen because the rugs pulled out from under me completely pulled out and I'm falling and I always fall towards God every time. I mean, uh, is that I, a choice I, or is that a natural reaction? I, I just go to God. Yeah. I'm like, okay, God, take it, take it away. Yeah. <laughs> Pick it away. Calgon, take it away. God. However I picture God, it's just, I cling to God. I feel like I sail through the cosmos holding onto God's ankles or feet, but I feel safe in God. That's just the way I, I put together. I mean, I don't. I feel like this world is very scary for me. Um, a lot of times, I love the natural world, but I'm aware that things happen here, and my flesh is scared of those 
you know, things happening. I, I can't get away from that. And, um, like I said early on, I wanted to leave the physical and be in the meta and just be with God all the time. And then I was like, you know, I'm just being mean to people. <laughs> I can't be mean to people. Is that what I came here to do? You know, I got to raise my kids. I love my kids. Um, but this idea of balancing heaven and earth is mm-hmm. really yeah. important and, and um, loving the natural world. And but when 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 it gets really scary, it's nature and calling. So it's for me, it's like calling the heavens down to earth. It's just it's a natural instinct. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think there are places that we can attend to that have that natural frequency anyway, to show us that it is possible to have those moments here. Mm-hmm. I recently. Um, Excuse me. As as you were speaking about calling the heavens down, I was it just uh, activated the memory recently. I was on the Big Island in Hawaii and um, going down this very long road in a state park, national park of the volcano, place I hadn't been before. Um, took me, you know, down from the volcano down to the ocean, and there was a petro there is a petroglyph part there and um you have to walk in you have to park and walk in and it's a ways and um i didn't quite know what to expect but when i got there there were the signage showing and explaining where we were what was going on what had gone on and uh there was uh 23,000 examples of petroglyphs had been identified of which 16,000 16,000 of them were these little holes that were carved Mm -hmm. into the lava from an earlier time and uh, what it was people had been tribes and and families had been affiliated and associated and and with the land for centuries and eons and they would come after a birth of a, of a child and they would bring the umbilical cord of the child and they would carve into the lava holes that would contain the umbilical cord mm-hmm. and the idea was that um, from the heavens came the spirit mm-hmm. this young child and the umbilical cord was the bridge and then they took the bridge the umbilical cord to this place a sacred place and uh, offered the umbilical cord to the planet, to the earth, yeah. so that it would, it, um, as an offering, but also as a uh, insurance policy that this planet, this earth, this place where they were living, would also then embody and hold and protect this this spirit, this young child. Yeah. And it, it was absolutely phenomenal. And then later I went to a... Um, uh, a, a place that had uh, books and there was this one book on the petroglyphs mm-hmm. and so it was all documented from the university and it the one uh, petroglyph that has stayed with me was actually in the book and it it was just my anchor and talked about again the umbilical cords and um and th- being in that place, being walking around, and, and you're up on a boardwalk, so you're not disturbing the petroglyphs, but so you have a really good view. You're looking down, and you can mm-hmm. see where people were sitting and how they carved them in. And some some of the sections had like eight or nine holes, so that you could tell they had a large family. Some only had one. Mm-hmm. And there were these little icons of people. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, I'm looking at what was here. Mm-hmm. And, and I... You know, I think part of this podcast is also part of how we are documenting our our legend, our our mm-hmm. sense of our legacy. Because I don't have a little hole in a lava that has my umbilical cord. You know, there's I don't really have that place mm-hmm. that these people did, and it really um, infused me with the sense of being connected to place. Mm-hmm. Again, that is a, a theme that that comes in my life mm-hmm. often. So I came home really wondering and and curious about how, you know, what is my umbilical cord to this earth during oh, this time? Oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. I love the image of the tree for that reason. Mm-hmm. 
the roots above and the branches above. Yeah, like yeah. we're reaching in with our roots and we're reaching up with our branches. Is to me well, my tattoo. <laughs> That's what it is. Tree of life. And yeah, I think as a child, like I played outside a lot. I was in trees a lot. I felt safe away from people. I felt safe with my animals. Kids could be mean. I mean, I grew into having a deep love for people as a healer and as an artist. Uh, it's fun to inter interchange and expand as a healer. But it's um, my favorite place is like beyond my kayak or in the ocean. I <laughs> know. Uh, sitting, feeling the heaven and earth together, mm -hmm. you know? And I think. Uh, coming back to life that way is really important. When my mom died, it was just so devastated. And I lived in a beautiful place where I could sit in the canyons and I could just wail or I could just uh, lay down and let the sunlight of love come to me and say, how do I live with this loss? She was a wonderful, we were so close. And uh, I, I, the question was so big. How could I ask it of anyone but the one who brought me here? sustain me mm -hmm. I have to have, the one who brought me here you are the one that must help me and I always got help never did went through dark periods but never did not get it yeah I think that's um, the message of our of our podcast today is that there is great darkness and and as our listeners um, might relate to some of our the bits and pieces of our story uh, the idea is that there is a choice and that there is a support the idea of fear um, and doing it anyways yeah. yeah that's that's always been my my thin lip of um, hesitation as well it's enough to keep me from not doing it yeah. I have a poem here from Cahill Gabran oh yeah I love yeah, Cahill Gabran okay. So I think this speaks to the sense of fear mm -hmm. and doing it anyway. Yeah. It is said that before entering the sea, a river trembles with fear. She looks back at the path she has traveled from the peaks of the mountains, the long winding road crossing forests and villages. And in front of her, she sees an ocean so vast that to enter there seems nothing more than to disappear forever. But there is no other way. The river cannot go back. Nobody can go back. Mm. To go back is impossible in existence. The river needs to take the risk of entering the ocean because only then will fear disappear because that's where the river will know it's not about disappearing into the ocean, but of becoming the ocean. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes this week's episode of the Soul Path Sessions podcast with Deborah Mites Pearson and Brenda Littleton. If you'd like to hear more about living a more soulful life, please subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast app. And be sure to check out the show notes and links below. For more information from Deborah, visit soulpathsessions.com. And for Brenda, brendalittleton.com. Thank you for listening, and remember to follow your soul. It knows the way.